Well, I want to welcome all of you uh, again to this uh, fourth and final uh, session uh, for our lecture series, our Land Center Lectures. Thank all of you for coming, and uh, we had a great time with Dr. Nathan Finn, uh, provost at North Greenville University, uh, a Baptist historian, author, um, and uh, had a great time here. So I'm going to ask him a few questions about some of the topics we talked about and other things. But uh, if you have questions for Dr. Finn, uh, there's a microphone over here um, to my right, your left, up toward the front here that you can make your way there and ask questions. Um, like I always tell people in class and other places, uh, phrase your question in the form of a question. Uh, <laughs> not in the form of an essay. We love essays here, but for this session, we like questions. So. Um, Dr. Finn, uh, first of all, thank you for being here and uh, spending time with us here at Southwestern. Uh, it's been a great pleasure. Um, first question is, uh, we spent some time in the first lecture talking about uh, sort of Baptist public theology throughout the, throughout the years. I want to back up from that a little bit and just ask you, for most people here, you know, people here know they're going to a Southern Baptist institution grew up in Southern Baptist churches, maybe not everyone, but probably most. Um, but I think a lot of Southern Baptists may not always uh, think of their Baptist identity or think of what it means to be a Baptist. So what would you say, first of all, why would you say it's important to understand Baptist distinctives? You know, if someone is saying, you know, I'm a conservative Christian, I'm pro-life, I'm conservative, you know, I hold to Christian orthodoxy, uh, what is distinctive about being a Baptist? Why does it matter? That's a loaded question, but... No, it definitely is a loaded question, but that's okay. So we definitely live in what many have called a post-denominational sort of era. So this is not just a Baptist conversation. We could be having this conversation if we were at a Presbyterian school or a Lutheran school or whatever the case might be. Um, but I definitely think there's a sense in which it used to be the case that believers across traditions, by and large, uh, had a deep sense of being a part of that tradition, and we've lost some of that in, uh, in our contemporary culture. So if I'm thinking about Southern Baptists in particular, um, I like to argue that there are three different ways that Southern Baptists approach their Baptist identity. So you have some who are Southern Baptists by conditioning. They are born into a family that's Southern Baptist, They've attended Southern Baptist churches, but they really don't know necessarily what that means. They just know, like, this is my congregation and grandma's buried in the graveyard out on the side of the, the church, and that was the youth group I went to. But they can't really articulate anything that that means about uh, being a Baptist besides maybe we dunk people. Then you have Baptists who are not just Baptists by uh, conditioning. You have some who are Baptists by convenience. And I think this is the far bigger group and the growing group that is uh, emblematic of the post-denominational era. So these are the folks who say, I just know I'm a Bible-believing Christian. And I don't know a whole lot about the difference between Baptists or Presbyterians or Methodists or non-denominational, but I just want to be in a church where the Bible's being preached. <clears throat> or I just want to be in a church that has the type of music I like. Or I just want to be in a church that has a good youth ministry because I have teenagers. Or I just want to be in a good church that's close to home that's not weird. And so these are the type of folks, it doesn't matter where they, uh, it doesn't matter where they are at different times, they're just looking for the right experience or the right baseline conviction. So they might be a member of a Southern Baptist church in Fort Worth. But if they move to Houston, they might join a Presbyterian church. And if they move to North Carolina, they might join a non-denominational church. And that non-denominational church might really be a Baptist church, but it's too cool to call itself Baptist. So that's <laughs> kind of the, the, the Baptist by convenience. And by the way, I became a Baptist as a matter of convenience. Uh, I was entering high school. I grew up in a mainline liberal denomination. My parents weren't theologically minded, but they knew enough to know that uh, the church had jumped the shark biblically 
uh, for those of you who know what that phrase means. And so they visited around over the course of a year. We visited uh, a couple of Baptist churches. We visited two Methodist churches. We visited an Assemblies of God church. Uh, we went to all these different churches and ultimately settled on Central Baptist Church in Waycross, Georgia, because it had a big, healthy youth group. And I was 15 years old, and my parents wanted me to be a part of a youth ministry, and that began my Baptist journey. And so there, I'm not necessarily saying that there's anything wrong with Baptist by convenience. I just don't think that's the ideal. I think the ideal is not merely conditioning, which is not going to be everybody's story, or convenience, but it's really Baptist by conviction. And that's where you actually know what the church believes, and, and you've bought into the doctrine and the mission and the emphases of that church. And so for Baptists, that means believing certain things about the gospel that you can find in other places, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and was raised again on the third day according to the scriptures and everything that we would extrapolate out of that. It certainly means having a high view of scripture, but you can find that in other places. It means being committed to missions and evangelism, but you can find that in other places. I think what makes Baptist distinctive is our understanding of the church, that you believe before you belong in the fullest sense, a, uh, a commitment to a regenerate church membership. That is evidenced by believers' baptism by immersion. We, we baptize disciples, not just people who are raised in the church, but people who've uh, bowed their knee to Jesus as their King and Savior. And we believe in a certain type of church freedom, uh, the freedom for the whole congregation to make decisions, at least the most important decisions about their church, uh, what we would call congregationalism, uh, the freedom for the church to set its own agenda under the lordship of Christ with, with open Bibles and callous knees without somebody coming in and saying you have to do this or that and imposing that, uh, local church autonomy. And, uh, and the idea that we talked about yesterday in that lecture of, of liberty of conscience, that uh, you know, we believe in soul freedom and free churches and a free state. I think those are the historic Baptist distinctives. And then I think what Southern Baptists bring to the table alongside that is our strong commitment uh, to cooperative mission, that, that even though uh, every local church is autonomous, that we choose to partner together for the sake of ministry and mission. We partner together for the sake of uh, theological education. We partner together for the sake of uh, global and North American missions. We partner together for the sake of Christ-centered cultural engagement. And that binds us together as a group. And so I think part of the challenge in a post-denominational age is getting people excited about that. I'm less interested in them being excited about this abstract thing called the Southern Baptist Convention, as I am getting them excited about those priorities. And I think that to the degree we can get them to buy into those priorities, they see the value in being Southern Baptist and being a part of this tradition that's bigger than just that local congregation. Mm. Uh, I grew up independent Baptist, so Southern Baptists look really good from where I was sitting. Um, <laughs> um, so I'm also a Southern Baptist by uh, conviction. Um, I want to skip ahead to your, your final lecture. One of the things that Mark, you said Mark, uh, Dr. Dockery, which I really respect and, and, and is a model for me, but this idea of being convictionally Baptist, but also open-handed toward other evangelical traditions. Can you kind of explain what that looks like? Like why both are important? Why, why being rooted in your tradition? So for us, being rooted as Baptists, is important, but also it's important to where we can partner and, and, and do things together with other evangelical tr traditions, why that's important. So I think it's important because both the particular and the universal matter for different reasons. So there's a sense in which uh, we are Christians, full stop. And I do think that's the most important thing that anybody can say about us, is that we're Christians. We're followers of Jesus Christ. We're a part of this great river, if you will, uh, that we call uh, being a follower of Christ. And, and that's the most important thing that anybody can say about us. 
It is the case that we don't live in an ideal world where saying I'm a Christian is enough about everything that we want to say, right? It's the most important thing to say about us, but it doesn't answer every question because Christians don't agree on certain things and because there are lots of people that call themselves Christians that are not Christians. And so I think it's important for us to not just say that we're a part of the river, but that we enter into that river from a particular tributary. And for me, my honest sincere conviction is that that Baptist tributary looks more like the scriptures than other tributaries. I don't say that to be demeaning to those other traditions. I think sometimes they bring things to the table that we need to learn from them. But if I thought that the Presbyterian tributary looked more like the Bible, I would be Presbyterian. If I thought the Pentecostal tributary looked more like the Bible, I would be uh, Pentecostal. And so uh, I think it's important that we understand that we're a part of something bigger than ourselves as Christians, but we're a particular type of Christian. So I think the reason that it matters when it comes to cooperation is because no single church can do everything that, that churches could or should do, right? And so that's why we cooperate with each other. But even whenever we extend that to the larger Christian tradition, there are things that we can learn uh, from those other traditions. I think uh, we can learn something about the value of a high view of Scripture and taking every thought captive to Christ from the Reformed tradition. I think we can learn something about the cost of discipleship from the Radical Reformation. I think we can learn something about the beauty and value of Christian worship from the Anglican tradition. I think we can learn something about the synthesis between evangelism and activism from the Wesleyan tradition. And that doesn't mean we do all those things exactly like those traditions do. I hope those traditions can learn something about the priority of the local church and the urgency of evangelism and missions from the Baptist tradition. But I think we complement each other, right? There's this great mosaic of Christian faith. And, uh, and Baptists bring something to the table. When it comes to cooperation, I think we have to ask the question, what are the things that we can cooperate with other Christians who disagree with us on? I'm persuaded that's not church planting. I don't think we can plant churches with non-Baptist churches because I think we have a different understanding of what a local church is and what those priorities are. So I'm not going to partner uh, with an Anglican church or a Methodist church to start a new congregation. But I think that we can partner uh, with other Christians in evangelism, and joyfully so. I think we can partner with other Christians in some of the things that we alluded to yesterday with Christ-centered cultural engagement. I want to stand with Christians and, frankly, even with non-Christians who hold to the sanctity of human life. Now, I don't want to stand with them in such a way that it would prevent me handing a non-Christian a gospel tract. Or it would prevent me from having honest conversations with a Presbyterian about what's a valid baptism. But I want to stand together with them on the sanctity of human life. And so I think we just need to constantly be asking, what are those areas that Christian is enough and we can cooperate with other Christians? And what are those areas where being Baptist means You've got to be a Baptist or you've got to be really close to our convictions for us to be able to cooperate. And what that looks like with evangelism and what that looks like with church planting and what that looks like with uh, cultural engagement of various types, th th those are different ways to apply those questions. And, and we may not all agree on exactly how to tease all that out, uh, but hopefully we at least agree in principle that there's some things that we can only do with people who closely agree with us. And there's other things that we can do with just about anybody who bows the knee to Jesus as Lord. And it's just a matter of navigating what those issues are in a particular community and in a particular context and with particular costs and benefits, depending upon uh, what that cooperation might be in that context. I want to I double down on that for a second. Then I want to ask you about cultural engagement. Um, if you're talking to students, you know, this is the setting and the season of life where you're you're kind of engaging a lot of traditions in your, in your reading. Yeah. So even here in seminary or in college, they're reading all sorts of people from different faith traditions. What is your recommendation to students um, in that kind of reading? So let's say they're reading a Presbyterian on, on an aspect of theology, or they're reading Anglican over here, or maybe may even um, 
dipping into Catholic social teaching mm -hmm. when it comes to cultural engagement. How do you, what is your recommendation to students in terms of discerning what is uh, good and worthy and, and other ways? So what I say to students, and, and keep in mind, I, I know that this is a primarily or at least a historically graduate institution that has undergraduate programs. I teach in a predominantly undergraduate institution that happens to have graduate programs. So most of the students I teach in my institution are 17 to 23 traditional undergrads, most of whom are professing Christians from Christian homes, and probably uh, well over half of them are Southern Baptists, but some of them don't know it. So that's kind of the average student that, that we're teaching. And what I encourage them to do is to read widely and to be open to learning, but also to not forget from whence they came and to filter everything they read through the lens of Scripture. Now, there's a couple of reasons I do that. Maybe you've seen this phenomenon before. College student comes from uh, Burnt Hickory Baptist Church, and he's never really read anything besides maybe the scriptures in a daily quiet time, we hope, but never really been challenged in any way. And the first time he comes across something that sounds a little bit better than his home church, he becomes a jerk about it. And so he's exposed to a different form, a different philosophy of worship. And he says, this is way better than the way my church did it. Or he's introduced to a new doctrine that wasn't emphasized in his home church, or maybe even believed in his home church, and he's like, now I found the answer, or whatever the case might be. So I don't ever want a student to, in his or her discovery, become arrogant about the folks who have nurtured him, even if, in some ways, he's grown in good ways. Because maybe his home church wasn't that healthy. But he still doesn't need to be arrogant about that, right? So on the one hand, you can't forget from whence you came. And you just have to filter everything from Scripture. And so we say to students all the time uh, that many of the books we're going to read, and we call it Christian Studies at North Greenville, many of these Christian Studies books are going to be written by Christians and other traditions. And we want to constantly be asking, where are they right? And, and what can we learn from them? There's a reason that my uh, theologically conservative Baptist professors have assigned this book. They think there's something I can learn from this Methodist or uh, this Anglican or this Presbyterian or whatever. But we also say it's, it's okay to disagree with some of what they say. That's going to happen. How many of you have read the book Knowing God by J.I. Packer? Knowing God is the only book I can think of that I've read at least four times but was never required to read. <laughs> I've had some other books I've read four times because I had to read it four times uh, for something, I, a class I was taking or teaching or a writing project. I've just read Knowing God because I love it that much. But you know what? I get to a couple of chapters in Knowing God and I go, I don't know about that, Dr. Packer. And that's okay. It's a great book that has been formative, formative in how I think about uh, the Christian life. And, and there are areas where I think he's wrong, biblically. He would say, were he with us, he thinks I'm wrong, biblically. And one day in the great by and by, we'll see who's right. And so you want, you know, I want to teach students to be discerning in what they're reading and, and to be open to learning, but filter everything from Scripture. And it's okay to say, that's a really good book, but I think he's wrong on that issue. Or that's a really helpful book, but I think she's right on that issue. Or I think that's a crummy book, but I learned this thing from it or that thing from it. And that's just part of a liberal arts-based education. And in a Christ-centered context, we're trying to do a liberal arts-based education uh, while taking every thought captive to Christ under the final authority of Scripture. That's such a good word for students. So you're saying that occasionally there, there's a, a time when a, a college student or seminary student goes back and knows more than their home pastor? I've never... You know, I'm just saying that once <laughs> or twice... I've seen somebody leave a college or seminary and go back and be not a nice person in conversations with their pastor or their Sunday school teachers. Never here. I mean, I've heard that happens. Never at, at, at uh, Southwestern or right. Texas Baptist College. Right. Okay, let's talk a little bit about what we call Baptist public theology, which is essentially saying this is how Baptists have engaged the culture and the state. So if, if someone were to say, well, look, I'm a conservative Christian, 
grew up in a Southern Baptist church. Um, I'm pro-life, generally vote conservatively on a number of issues. So what makes the way that Baptists do that distinctive? You know, what, why should I care about that? This is a great question. I'm not 100% sure I know the answer, and so I'm going to give kind of what I've been thinking through with the caveat that I'm, I'm thinking through this, so this is not a settled conviction. Because, again, we should be partnering with everybody and learning from everybody when it comes to Christ-centered cultural engagement. But I do think there are some instincts, not necessarily always convictions. I'm still wrestling through the language here. But at least some instincts that Baptists bring to the table whenever we think about cultural engagement. I think one of those instincts is the value of the local church. And that it's not just that we're free agents out there who care about these things. But we care about this because we've been formed by a particular local church... And we think there are certain things that local churches ought to be motivated about, whether that's the sanctity of human life or religious liberty for all people or the dignity of a biblical understanding of of marriage and family and gender and things like that. Like those aren't just privatized convictions about culture. Uh, We want to see churches have the right view and be forming disciples who think rightly about those issues. And so I don't think that is unique to Baptists, but I think that's a Baptist emphasis whenever it comes to uh, political theology. Um, I think another key Baptist emphasis whenever it comes to political theology is exactly whatever we, what we talked about yesterday with uh, the principle of free churches and a free state and, and recognizing that whatever it means for us to pursue cultural renewal, whatever it means for us to pursue healthy government, whatever it means for us to pursue human flourishing, that cannot mean that we're trying to usher in God's kingdom and create some sort of theocratic institution where we're imposing what we think is right on other people based upon means outside of the proclamation of the gospel. Um, I just, I think when Baptists start acting like they want state churches, that's a scary place to go. Uh, because it's going gonna, it's gonna to make murky what ought not to be murky, and it's going to confuse what ought not to be confused. So I think that that's a second gesture. Um, but I think a third emphasis that we see among Baptists, and we're kind of hashing this out right now, but for me at least, uh, framing public engagement as an aspect of mission has, I think, often been uh, a Baptist distinctive. And even when it hasn't been, uh, maybe let me let me speak prescriptively to that instead of descriptively. I think there's a certain type of evangelical, Bible-believing Christian, whatever terminology you want to use, who say, we do missions and we do cultural engagement, and those are two of the things Christians ought to do. And I understand why we think that way. We have different agencies, for example. In Southern Baptist Convention, you have different... Uh, institutional missions to promote those various things. I personally, when I think about this, and I think it's because of my Baptistness, um, I see there's this category of mission where we are called to holistically uh, be out there in the world as ambassadors for Christ, caught up in what God is doing in the world. And then under that umbrella, that includes missions with an S and evangelism and cultural engagement and apologetics or, or whatever. And, and, and there's more overlap, or at least there ought to be more overlap in how we approach those things than sometimes we do. Uh, I don't want to do cultural engagement and not be a soul winner. I don't want to be a soul winner and not care about the sanctity of human life. I don't want to go be a foreign missionary and ignore cultural evils that are happening around me. So again, I just think we, we tend to, uh, we live more holistically than we think sometimes whenever it comes to those matters. Like we know it all matters. And so I think part of being a Baptist is it's not, an, it's not like original to our DNA, but since at least the late 1700s, we've cared deeply about the Great Commission. And so framing all of that under uh, Jesus is Lord, he's commanded us to, uh, to go therefore and to make disciples and to teach them to observe all things. If the lordship of Christ matters, 
and becoming a disciple matters and learning all things matters, then I want to frame all of that under maybe not political theology, but what I would call public witness and frame that in a Great Commission way of thinking. Uh, so I admit, again, that's me sharing with you out loud what I've been processing internally over the last several years. That's not a hard and fast argument. I'm not in print on that. I may regret that the camera's on right now. But that's how I've been processing those issues over the past few years and how I'm asking others, both other Baptists and even friends and other traditions, what do you think about? Where would you push back? Or do you agree with this? And those are the sort of conversations I'm having with others on this topic. Yeah, uh, I want to, that's a great answer, by the way. And uh, just, you know, what does it look like as a Christian, as a Baptist Christian to, to live, you know, faithfully in the world? Um, so you framed in, in when you're talking about uh, Baptist and cultural engagement, the kind of three positions, the, the sort of secularist position, if you will, the, um, and then the accommodation, accommodationist position, and then the, the more uh, acknowledgement position in terms of the, the way we've thought through those things. Obviously, Dr. Land... Uh, yeah, I'm going to start uh, using his alliteration. I yeah. like that better than the way I framed it. Our, our namesake here was accommodationist. So... You, you talked to, you talked briefly in your lecture about that. Dr. Lance talked about this, but ways in which Baptists were distinct, say in the '90s, where some evangelicals wanted a, you know, an amendment for school prayer to mandate Christian prayer, and uh, Southern Baptists opposed that. Um, some of those conversations are happening now too, in terms of what that looks like. So, do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Hesitation. <laughs> Well, I'm just trying to think through that was I'm thinking through how you asked the question. So am I talking about the three different streams or am I talking about how we're navigating? No, you are. You obviously argued for accommodationist position that, you know, we want to bring our we want to bring our faith to the public square to inform these issues. But we don't want the government putting their <clears throat> foot on the scale in favor of anyone. Right. You don't want the government playing theologian. Just right. can you explain that position more and why you think that's important? So, I am persuaded as a Baptist follower of Christ uh, and as somebody who believes in the supreme authority of Scripture, I am persuaded that it is not the place of the government to adjudicate matters of ultimate importance. I think it is the government's job to promote justice and human flourishing. I think the government does that best when it is influenced by followers of Christ who have been shaped by a biblical understanding of those things. But I think even in God's common grace, you can still have a government that gets much about justice and much about human flourishing right. So what I would advocate is Christians being motivated and mobilized as Christians to advocate for their values in the public square and to be unashamed in saying, this is who we are. And yes, we are this way because this is what we believe the Bible teaches, but we just think this is best. And here's the reasons why we think this promotes human flourishing and in a healthy culture and whatnot. But what I don't want is for us to even implicitly attempt to overthrow Jesus and make, I mean, overthrow the government and make Jesus our theocratic king. Some evangelicals tilt in that direction. Sometimes Baptists say things on Twitter that make me nervous that tilt in that direction. <laughs> I don't think that's the way we want to go. But I also don't think we need to disengage just because some people are weird about this. So... So Dan Darling and I are part of a text group. So maybe you're a part of text groups. We have a text group with several friends. And, uh, and, and this is something that we debate in that text group even. And, uh, and as I've talked with guys in that text group, we, you know, we have people who've pastored in different parts of the country. And, uh, and you know, we, we have one friend who has a church that is mostly filled with people in their 20s and 30s. And at times... They're not 
really engaged on the big cultural questions because they're, they're young. And, and, and in some cases, they don't like some of the way that their parents or grandparents were engaged on those issues. And they've kind of overreacted by being disengaged. But then we have another friend who pastored a church, multi-generational, where he felt like many of the people in their 50s and 60s were overly engaged. And, uh, and they cared more about what was happening in Washington than they did about missions and evangelism. And so, and, and, and again, and, and, and what's funny is one of those guys, and I'm not saying anything to you I've not said to them. Uh, one of those guys will say, well, you know, the problem in the SBC is too many churches are filled with people that are disengaged from this and that. And uh, they don't care about these issues. And the other one's like, man, the problem with the SBC is that too many of our churches are just obsessed with partisan politics. Well, they're both looking at experiences in their particular churches and their particular towns, two very different churches, and they're sort of assuming that that's a global issue when the reality is they're both issues. They're both, both issues. We do have individual Christians and churches that are too disengaged, and they have sort of a, I'm not going to get sullied by getting in those cultural debates. And if I'm just winsome enough and love people and show them a better way, then secularists are going to go, oh, I want what those guys have. And they're going to be you know, mystically changed by that. And then we have other congregations that are like, we are going to vote Jesus into office. <laughs> And God is going to use my favorite party or my favorite politician. And even if it's not my favorite politician, the guy that's now my favorite politician is going to be the Cyrus that God is going to use. And, and so you've got these, these different folks, and they're just tempted by different things. And so I think what we've got to be doing at all the time is public, political, you know, kind of pick your, your word there. But we've, we've got to be discipling people to think healthy about this. And for some folks, and sometimes even maybe most of the people in a church, that means saying you can't duck and hide when it comes to sexual revisionism in our culture. Because Drag Queen Story Hour is coming to our public library next week. And in other churches, it's maybe saying, brother, I think you might be making an idol out of partisan politics. And you might be expecting your favorite political party to deliver more than it's capable of and that even it should be promising. And we just have to, we have to navigate that. And, and, and for pastors, since many of you are or will be pastors, it's knowing your people. What are their temptations? Where are their healthy instincts and where are their unhealthy instincts? And, and, and what does it mean to gently but intentionally push back on those unhealthy instincts and to, to disciple them to be a better way. Now, that's assuming that the pastor has a healthy view. And let's be honest, you've got disengagement pastors and you've got idolatrous pastors as well. So I get that. But, but the buck stops with the pastor being the lead discipler and having a healthy understanding of these things and trying to help the folks in the congregation to understand that as well. That's, a, that's an awesome answer. And now you can breathe a sigh of relief. I'm not going to ask you any more questions about politics. <laughs> so I want to talk about history and Baptist history. So if you're a student here at Texas Baptist College or uh, Southwestern Seminary, uh, you have to take, you're required to take some classes in history, but also Baptist history. So if you're at uh, Texas Baptist College, you're studying with Dr. McKinney or in the seminary studying with Dr. Wills. If you're, um, if a student were to ask you, you know, I'm, I, I think more about systematic theology or I think more about preaching or whatever, why, why should I care about church history? But more importantly, why should I care about Baptist history? W w what does it matter? Why should I study that? So for years, uh, the first half of my academic career, if you will, uh, for eight years, I was a full-time faculty member at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. And I taught church history and Baptist history and, and taught many of our students in those, in those classes. And what I would say to them in Baptist history on the first day of class is I want you to hear me say loud and clear, Baptist history is not the most important class that you're going to take in seminary. And I would name a handful of other classes that I thought were more important than Baptist history. But I would say to them, here's what I, my goal is. My goal is at the end of 15 weeks... Not for you to say Baptist history is my favorite class, though if you do, blessed are you among men and women. <laughs> what I want you to say is I really needed that class. 
Because now I understand my denominational family story and where I fit into that story. And that's going to impact the way that I think about systematic theology or preaching or evangelism or whatever the case might be. Or if you're one of my 15% of students who are not Baptists, you're going to know what this school believes and you won't be able to leave saying, I was not introduced to the Baptist tradition and, and what it means to be a part of uh, the Baptist tradition. And so uh, for me, uh, that Baptist history or heritage course or even to a degree that systematic theology course that's taught by a real Baptist who knows what it means to be Baptist, that's part of your formation as Baptist ministers. And if you are not a Baptist minister, it's good for you. No, that's it. That's the message is good for you. Because you're going to be a Baptist in the next life, and so you'll be familiar <laughs> with it in this life in preparation of the life to come. I like that. But no, it's part, it's part of your intellectual and spiritual formation in some ways. It's, it's learning the story. And so I would encourage you not to think of it as uh, Dr. McKinney is having us read this book on Baptist history or Dr. Wills is giving a lecture on Baptist history. They are doing that. But in some ways, it's the academic version of, for those of you who've had this experience, when you sit down with your grandparents and you say, tell me about these people in these pictures who I don't know. What are those stories? Why did that matter? How has that affected where we are today, even if I've never met those people and I've never thought about that? That's what those Baptist history and more broadly speaking, those church history professors are doing. They're inviting you into a story. And uh, Timothy George used to say, there's 2,000 years of history uh, between Jesus and your grandma. And you need to know that history. We're being invited into the story. And, uh, and, and Baptist history, church history, American church history, those sorts of classes are uh, in a seminary context or a Christian college context especially, are done best whenever they are taught by believers who themselves are excited about that story and they're inviting students to get excited about that story as well. That's such a great answer. Um, I would also say too, you know, studying history kind of humbles you, right? In, in the sense that you realize uh, that great idea you have, you're not the first one to arrive at it, number one. Number two, doesn't, it, doesn't understanding history make it should make you a little less anxious about the age we're in as well? Oh, absolutely. I mean, because what you realize is uh, every snapshot in Christian history is a snapshot in time where people were loving Jesus and they were failing miserably. They were saints and they were sinners. They were struggling with the anxieties and the threats of their day. They were trying to be faithful. And so it gives us a long view to help us navigate things and, and to realize that maybe the sky is not always falling when we think it's falling. Uh, you know, things get better and worse over time, and we're always navigating that. And, uh, and as far as the humility thing, you know, I always get nervous with somebody whenever they say, I have figured out this great quandary. You know, no, nobody knew the answer to this question. I've figured out this question. This is how you reconcile these two issues, or this is what the Bible really teaches about this thing. And whenever somebody says that and nobody else has ever said that, that's how cults get started. <laughs> so we used to have this church. We used to have this church when I was at Southeastern. It was a great, healthy church. So I'm not criticizing the church itself. But there was this church right down the road from the seminary. Joshua Wagner may remember this as well. Uh, they had a sign up for years that said, a fresh way to think about church. And it was such a great church. We had professors who were there. We had students who were there. But I would just say to my students sometimes, you know, I love those guys, but I don't want a fresh way to think about church. Fresh ways to think about church, that leads to the weirdness. <laughs> I, want to think about, I want to think about church in healthy ways, not fresh ways. And healthy ways means thinking about church the way that we've always thought about church while also contextualizing that to our specific context in this particular community, reaching these particular people. And church history helps us to think that way. Okay, so I have two more questions for you, and then we want to open it up. If any of you have questions, there's a mic right there uh, to my right, to your left. So be thinking of questions um, for Dr. Finn. So let's say you're talking not to the student who's saying, why should I study history, but to the student who 
as you said, is blessed among men because they thought your class was the, the best. Right. All three of those students, I love them. Yeah. Let's say they really love history and they, and they say, I want to be Dr. Nathan Finn when I grow up um, and teach history. What advice can you give them in terms of a career like that? Uh, uh, teaching, studying, all that kind of thing. So I get asked this question all the time. Sometimes in groups like this. In fact, this is the second time I've been asked this question in a seminary context in the last year. So I think the most loving thing I can do with you is shoot absolutely straight with you as an academic administrator in our sort of circles. Uh, There are not more jobs in the future. There are less jobs. Now, if God is calling you to be a theological educator and you are convinced in your heart that he's doing that, and others around you have said, this is what you need to do, and here's how we see God's blessing in your life and calling and gifts and things like that. If God's called you to do that, then he's going to work that out. And you need to put your yes on the table and trust him. But if you're just the sort of person who really loves church history or Old Testament or systematic theology or preaching or whatever the case might be, and you're making good grades and you're thinking, man, it's kind of fun being a student. And I like my professors. And it'd be fun to sit around all day and to read good books and teach classes and get paid like a youth minister but be living the dream. You know, if that's the, if that's, <laughs> if that's the sort of thing... If that's the sort of thing that you're thinking, you just need to know those sorts of positions are shrinking every year. There are very few places where seminary faculties are growing or college faculties. Everywhere they're condensing. Even in my institution, I'm looking, and it's it's a liberal arts university with 2,200 students. We have 154 full-time faculty members, and I'm asking the question, how can we have 125? Well, this is happening everywhere, across higher education and not just Christian higher education. So what I would say to you is if you think God has called you to be a professor, I would encourage you to ask the question, is God calling me to be a teacher and a scholar? And if he's calling you to be a teacher and a scholar, there are many pathways where you can use those gifts and do great good for the kingdom as a pastor theologian, as a missionary who's using those skills, as somebody who is writing for the church, as somebody who might go teach in a private Christian K-12 school, as somebody uh, who is part of uh, maybe some parachurch ministry. There's almost an infinite number of ways that you can fulfill that calling to be a teacher and a scholar. But if the desire is to be a full-time professor with an office on a campus, teaching eight or 10 classes a year to students who are sitting in front of you and getting a sabbatical every six years so you can write a book, I hope and pray that those jobs will always be there. But I'm just telling you there will not be as many in the future as there are right now. And there aren't as many now as there were 20 years ago. And so get down to the heart of the calling and then say, what are all the different ways that my yes is on the table to live out the implications of that calling? When people come to me and say, I would like to study with you to do a PhD, I'm, I'm at North Greenville, but I'm still uh, occasionally teaching the PhD program at Southeastern Seminary. I have one PhD student still, and occasionally somebody will ask to study with me, and I'll say go to Southwestern and study with someone there, or go to Southern and study with someone there. But if they ever say they really want to study with me, I'll ask them all kinds of questions about this. And one of the things that they've got to look me in the eye and say is I'm willing to spend the next three to seven years of my life reading all those books, writing all those papers, spending that money, and walk across the stage and never, ever teach a single class anywhere at a college or seminary, and I'm still convinced God is calling me to pursue that education for these reasons. And if they can't tell me this, I say, I'm not your guy. Because I just, I cannot tell you that that's going to happen. It might happen. 
but you'd be naive to think if I invest this time and do this work, there's a job that's there. There might be. Maybe you're that person. People get those jobs every year. I hire some of them. But the jobs are shrinking. They're not growing. So drill down to the heart of the calling and then let your yes be on the table for all the different ways, maybe even ways that you've not imagined yet, that the Lord might fulfill that calling. We need more people with advanced training in theology, church history, biblical studies, and every other discipline. We need more, not less. But we don't need more professors. So just live with your yes on the table. And if you have the gift, say, Lord, how would you use, how would you use me and these gifts and this knowledge for the sake of the kingdom? And he will answer those questions, even if it's a way that it was different than the answer you thought it was going to be. Whenever you were in your uh, third semester in seminary and thought, man, it would be fun to be a seminary professor one day. On that encouraging note, um, <laughs> one more question for you, and then we'll open up for, we have just a few minutes for questions. Um, I'll put you on the spot here. If you were going to give a couple of recommendations for books, uh, folks should read, particularly in the area of Baptist history, besides your great book called The Baptist Story, but any other recommendations you'd, you'd, you'd make in terms of church history and Baptist history? Church history or Baptist history? That's a yes. huge question, Dan. Um, so let me say this. There are a lot of helpful books that are out there. Um, so, I can, so let me recommend a couple of them. And in fact, I could even limit this to uh, good books off the Southwestern stream, if you will. Uh, I would encourage you, if you're interested in Baptist theology, to look at James Leo Garrett's study of Baptist theology. Baptist theology, a 400-year study. It is dense, but if you get your jollies off of Baptist theology, you're going to learn a lot uh, with this particular book. Let me encourage you, if you're interested in how Baptist history and theology can positively impact the Southern Baptist Convention, look at David Dockery's book, Southern Baptist Consensus and Renewal. Um, it's a wonderful book that draws deeply upon Baptist history and theology to kind of lay out a framework uh, for Southern Baptist flourishing. Uh, if you're really interested in how we can learn from Baptist history about how to have healthy churches with a healthy view of membership, uh, then look at Dr. Wills's book uh, about democratic uh, religion in the South, where he's uh, looking at churches, uh, Baptist churches down in God's country of Georgia, and how they practice meaningful church membership and redemptive church discipline in the 19th century. And there's all kinds of things uh, that you can apply from that book into uh, contemporary contexts uh, today. There's three examples of uh, just folks who are tied with Southwestern right now uh, that you can look at that I think would be very helpful. And even on religious liberty, uh, go back and check out the book First Freedom, which is a collection of essays that originated at a conference at Southwestern several years ago. There's been a second edition of the book now, but a number of faculty members who teach at Southwestern now or have taught at Southwestern over the last 15 years contributed to that book, and it's a wonderful uh, biblical, historical, practical introduction uh, to the idea of religious liberty for all people. Awesome. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Any, any questions for Dr. Finn? No questions? Oh, there's a question. Yeah. Yeah, please do. Thank you again for your time here. Uh, yesterday was really interesting. Uh, Genesis controversy among Southern Baptists. Uh, in your view, where does the denomination go from here as far as engaging culture on origins? Um, especially even among leading Baptist, Southern Baptist theologians, there's still all sorts of uh, positions theologically that have been taken. How do you engage the culture with such disparity uh, theologi the theologically? So I'm not going to pretend like my personal take on this is what everybody would say. So there's my caveat, right? This is just one Southern Baptist opinion. I think what we need to unite around is the idea that Scripture is authoritative and sufficient to tell us that God is the creator 
that he created all things through the instrumentation of his word, that he upholds all things that he created, that he created a literal Adam and a literal Eve at a literal point in time, and they are the literal parents of all of humanity. Uh, I think scripture is clear about those things, and I think that rules out, I think that rules out theistic evolution. Because I think you have to redefine what theism is or what evolution is to arrive at theistic evolution. I think if we can unite on those things, we'll be fine. What I don't want us to do is to divide over the age of the earth questions, because I don't think that we have a consensus on that. I think it's an important question, but I think Scripture is less clear on that than those other things. And I would rather us unite against the common enemy, if you will, of Darwinism and unite around the fact that God is the creator. And again, literal Adam and Eve and those sorts of things. I think that keeps us well within the heart of orthodoxy. It allows a little bit of latitude in the secondary questions within orthodoxy, and it makes clear who the enemy is. I don't want to see us shoot ourselves uh, with friendly fire while the real enemy is laughing. I would rather unite us around the most important things uh, and to speak with clarity about both the wrongness and the dangers of Darwinism and the danger in trying to find a mediating position between what Scripture says and Darwinism. Does that make sense? Other questions? Drew, yeah. First off, Dr. Tin, thank you very much for a series of uh, helpful and thought-provoking lectures. Thinking about the legislative side of accommodationism, I'm wondering, are there principles in our tradition that would help us navigate these extremes of saying, on the one hand, we want to legislate or advocate for legislation for all of biblical ethics, where, for instance, we would want state-sponsored churches, and then the other extreme of something like uh, an extreme libertarianism, but we don't want to really advocate for any of biblical ethics. Like, where, where, how do we find that happy Good medium question. between the two? I wish I knew the answer to that question. I mean, I, I, really, question. I think that's at the heart of the debate, that we're the family discussion that we're having right now. Um, and I think that there are a variety of scholars, pastors, activists, Christ-centered policy wonks uh, who are wrestling with those questions. I do think you've identified the right ditches. I think we want to avoid, on the one hand, um, trying to legislate revival, if you will. And I think on the other hand, we want to avoid a fatalistic sort of, we're just not going to be involved, and then whatever happens, we'll try to be faithful in the midst of that. I, I still think Scripture speaks clearly to the role of government being restraining evil and promoting justice. And so I think we need to be informed by the Scriptures and advocate for those very things. And I think it's okay to advocate for those very things. I think scriptures, Scripture doesn't always give us clarity on policy matters, but it gives, it gives us clarity on the big picture. So rather than disengaging or trying to read debatable policy matters into Scripture, I think we begin with this is what government does. Even bad governments, this is what they do. I mean, remember that uh, the biblical authors in the New Testament are writing in the context of the Roman Empire. I mean, there's much about that that we would say was bad. Uh, but even then, they understood this is the proper role of government. So I think as, as believers, so long as that's what's motivating us and that's what's informing the manner in which we're advocating for specific policies or specific legislation— that's fine, but what I don't want to do is say everybody has to agree with Christians for this to work. I don't think we're commanded to do that, and I don't think we're commanded to just be quietistic and wait for the whole world to go to hell in a handbasket, but we'll have healthy churches and strong families while that happens. I think we, we need to advocate uh, publicly, but I think it's, it's rooted in that restraining evil and promoting justice. But of course, the devil's in the details, and that's exactly the conversation that we're having right now. Thank you. Great yeah. question. Ethan? 
So uh, your answer there uh, helped to answer what I was processing through, but if, if you could explain a little bit, uh, so Southern Baptists have, within the last few decades, uh, been advocates for the sanctity of human life. Mm -hmm. uh, so then how should Southern Baptists think about the death penalty um, when, it, when it applies to a, a convicted felon? So if you could kind of help us think through that. You mean like my personal opinion about how Southern Baptists should think about it? <laughs> uh, let's do both. Yeah. I mean, I don't, you know, Southern Baptists, it seems to me, I've never done a poll, um, it seems that most Southern Baptists favor the death penalty in at least some situations. And I think favor it based on the logic that, first of all, the death penalty was practiced uh, in biblical times in certain situations. And uh, it says something about the value of the human life when there are certain crimes that are so heinous that the penalty is the taking of human life. And so I, I feel the weight um, of those arguments. And so I don't know that Southern Baptists, I mean, we, we've had resolutions on this over the years. I certainly don't think that this is something that the Baptist faith and message should have a clear statement on the death penalty. Christians have always debated this. Um, what I would say personally is I do think the Bible allows for the death penalty. I think that that is an appropriate practice in certain settings. But I also think there's evidence that in our culture, the death penalty has not always been practiced in just ways towards certain populations. So even as somebody who's not anti-death penalty, I think that there are reforms that could be brought to the laws that we practice and the, and the way that we practice the death penalty. Uh, and I think that that's a serious conversation that ought to unite at least some members of both of our major political parties. And so that's just kind of my personal take on it. But, uh, but I, don't, I don't think this is an issue that really divides Southern Baptists. I think most Southern Baptists are in favor of the death penalty. And I think most Southern Baptists respect the fact that some Christians aren't in favor of the death penalty. Uh, I just want to make sure that if, if our consensus is it's just to have it in principle, and if our laws reflect the fact, and right now they do in most places, that it's just to have it in principle, how do we practice it as justly as we can and make sure that there's not some populations who are uh, receiving that penalty at unjust rates or other populations that are getting off scot-free uh, because they're in the right place and know the right people or they have more cultural power at a given point in time. Does that make sense? Okay. Great question. Any other questions? Question? That's a great question. That is a great question. So, really great question. So I would, I would give them some personal advice and some advice to be applied publicly. So from a public standpoint, what I would want to say to them is, for whatever reasons you're entering into politics, make sure that at the heart of that, you're motivated by love for God and love for neighbor. You're motivated by a desire to be a part of uh, restraining evil and upholding justice and be committed to uh, authentic human flourishing that's guided by scriptures and, and let that guide the decisions that you're a part of making and even the compromises that you make and when you do compromise and don't compromise that let those things guide you. But I'm also very deeply concerned. I have known some Christian politicians 
Um, some of you in the room have known many Christian politicians. Sometimes politicians who are Christians, and this applies to both conservative and liberal politicians, if you will, um, their desire for do-gooding, however they define the do-gooding, can at times overwhelm their love for Christ and his church. And so I would also want to encourage that politician uh, to remain a person who is walking closely with Jesus. Stay in the word. Be deeply engaged in a local church. Be part of a worshiping and witnessing community. And, and don't allow what you would perceive to be the do-gooding to take the place of a vital, ongoing personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, what would it profit a man to uh, gain significant legislation and lose his soul? And so th that's the type of advice that I would want to give, both the motivations that are pushing someone into politics. I pray we have way more Christians involved in politics, not less. Uh, but I, I would hate to see someone make shipwreck of their faith while pushing for legislation that churches celebrate. You know, keep walking with Jesus even while seeking to be salt and light in the sphere of politics? That's a great question. Really, really yeah. thank you for doing that, for asking that question. So we have, I think we have time for a couple more. I know Dr. Land, you had a question, and then Kevin, uh, and we'll close out with Kevin. Thank you for being here. <clears throat> I'm enjoying it immensely. Um, I'd like to get your comment. It's a sort of a follow-up to the question that uh, she just asked. Uh, in 2008, um, George McGovern had just written a little book on Abraham Lincoln, and he was doing a book tour. And my wife and I, I told my wife, I said, you know, it's not often you get a chance to go hear somebody who was actually nominated for president. So no, though neither one of us voted for him, <laughs> we went to hear him. And first of all, it was sort of like going to a reunion of Woodstock, you know, <laughs> a lot of middle-aged ponytails and, and Birkenstocks. We, we feel sort of out of place. But <laughs> McGovern said, you know, when I wrote the Lincoln books, I realized that one of my big mistakes was I got too far ahead of the American people. He said, um, on, on, on the Vietnam War, he said, you know, I was a military hero. I didn't ever talk about it, but I flew 30 bombing missions over, over Europe. And he said, Lincoln clearly was always anti-slavery. But he was not an abolitionist because he knew abolitionism could not be achieved at the time that he was running for office and that he was working, trying to bring the American people along with him with the ultimate goal of first, not extending slavery and then trying to um, uh, uh, eliminate it. Um, and I'd like for you to talk about that and apply that to the abolitionist question we're having in the Southern Baptist Convention right now. Uh, those people who are arguing that since Roe v. Wade been overturned, there can be no compromise. We must have absolute abolition of abortion. Now, if, in my opinion, if we demand that, we'll lose everything. We won't get anything. That's not where the American people are. And that our goal should be, like Lincoln, to educate the American people, to move the American people, but get as much as we can while we can, save as many babies as we can, and then come back and save them. So that was, that was an example of a question in the form of an essay, Dr. Land. <laughs> But I do think, but, but you also, I, 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 Dr. Lane and I have talked about this, so he asked that question knowing my opinion about this. So I think the best thing I can say is that uh, I agree with what you articulated in the question. Um, I don't think, so I do think our goal as Christians should ultimately be uh, living in a world where abortion on demand is illegal in the United States of America. To God be the glory. I hope that that's what happens, and I think that we should take intentional steps towards that, but I think we have to balance uh, philosophy with reality in some ways. Uh, we live in a democratic republic where there are some places where a critical mass of the population uh, is not ready to embrace uh, even some restrictions on abortion on demand. We live in other places where they're ready to outlaw abortion in every instance uh, except uh, the life of the mother, which I would say is not abortion, uh, also playing off of what Dr. Land said yesterday, and then lots of places that are somewhere in between. So I think 
uh, we should not lose sight of the goal, the ultimate goal, but we should also be focused on what are the narrow victories. And in those places uh, where the needle can be moved several points uh, towards a position where abortion on demand is outlawed, praise God for that. And I hope they're able to do that. But God forbid that we substitute our desire for the perfect that is unattainable in the place of the good that is attainable. And every sort of law that can be passed that saves some lives and moves us closer to a culture of life, uh, that is a good thing, and and that should be celebrated. Uh, But we're not going to have all of the laws reflect what we think is the biblical ideal as pro-life Christians until we have cultural renewal. And so maybe a good way to even close, although you have a question too, don't you? Okay, so I'm not totally closing. But a good way to get close to closing, penultimately closing. Um, (laughs) Cultural engagement matters. And I hope you see that I'm deeply committed to that. But we also need revival. And cultural engagement is not the means to revival. But revived people care about Christ-centered cultural engagement. And so we need to understand that short of an unforeseen but possible in God's ways revival, abortion on demand is not going to be outlawed everywhere in the United States of America. So I think we should both labor towards laws that push back against the culture of death. We should pursue whatever gains can be gained in a particular state we should also be praying for revival because until the hearts of people are changed and abortion is unthinkable in the minds of most Americans and undesirable in the minds of most Americans, we're we're not going to see things change everywhere. Uh, I praise God for the Dobbs decision, but Dobbs is not the end. It's just the next stage in the pro-life movement. And the pro-life movement is now decentralized. It looks a little bit different in different states. And in every state, uh, may we be mobilized to do whatever good we can in that context while not giving up the fight and praying for revival in hope of that day uh, whenever abortion is uh, illegal in the United States. Kevin, one more, one more question, Kevin. So uh, thank you, Dr. Finn, for uh, the lectures. They've been fascinating. I was... Um, I really appreciated the third lecture, especially on kind of the character of a Christian educator within the context of Christian education. But I was wondering if you had some particular advice for those who may want to be Christian educators in the context of secular education. Yeah, Um, Is that something we ought to strive for? Um, As well as how do we sort of engage in particular challenges that come along with that. Yeah. No, I love that question. That's great. So I talked to my own faculty about this a couple of years ago, and uh, it was during a faculty workshop. And one of the things I said to them is there's two types of Christian educators, whether we're talking about uh, the university level or we're talking about the K-12 level, right? So there's the person who says, I want to be in a context where we can own taking every thought uh, captive to Christ. And there's the person who says, I want to be a Christian who is deeply shaped by my faith, but I want to be in a secular pluralistic context. And I think both of those are noble. And I think God calls people to do both of those. And we need more Christians, not less, doing both of those. But I think we need to understand that there are challenges, at least potential, that come with each. So you didn't ask this, but let me begin with my context. The challenge in my context is to be in a siloed Christian bubble where it's an echo chamber and everything that we're talking about is very insular and we're patting each other on the back about the biblical worldview and this and that, but we're not actually impacting the culture. Instead, we've unintentionally kind of uh, withdrawn from the culture and and we're, uh, we're a counterculture, but we're not a counterculture for the common good. And you see that temptation sometimes in Christian schools. But I think the challenge for the person who is going into a secular institution, you have to be willing 
to, uh, you have to be willing to be fired in that context. I can't think of a different way to say it. You have to be willing to be fired. I don't think you seek out professional martyrdom. I think there's all kinds of contexts where you can uh, be a faithful Christian. And, and in some of those contexts, you can even wear it on your sleeve. And everybody around you know that you're a Christian. Man, I'm in South Carolina. Half, of a, half the public school teachers in our secular schools are evangelical Christians. And all the students know that the teachers go to church and things like that. So again, I mean, there's definitely places where you can wear it on your sleeve. But you, there's also, there has to be a recognition that those government schools or those non-sectarian schools, if it's a private secular school of some sort, um, they're accountable ultimately to something that is not Jesus, right? And so there might be a scenario where a policy is passed that would bind your conscience as a Christian. And I think in those contexts, you can't be silent. You have to either say, here's how I can faithfully navigate that, and sometimes you can, or you have to say, I need to quietly leave, and sometimes you can. Or you have to say, I think it's best for me to take a stand on this, even if I go down with the ship. And that looks different in every context and every individual. But I think if you go into that world, you have to understand, I might get fired. But I'm okay with that in the future, because for now, I want to be salt and light in that sphere and have whatever influence I can for the sake of the kingdom. Uh, whenever I'm in that school. And again, it, and if you end up in a Christian school, it's how can we do more than just be in the Christian echo chamber? How are we actually educating students to make a difference, our language at North Greenville, to be transformational leaders for church and society? Uh, how is it that we're doing that? Great answer. One bonus question. Who wins between Tennessee and Georgia? So the Georgia Bulldogs are the best team in the country. Tennessee's quarterback is really, really good. So because we live in a good world that God created, Georgia ought to win. Because we live in a fallen world, Tennessee might win. <laughs> Go dogs. That's great. Would you all give Dr. Nathan Finn a, a hand? Thank you. And, uh... I want to thank all of you for attending uh, these lecture series, uh, and they'll be posted on the Land Center website in a couple weeks here, so we'll let you all know about that. But I want to thank all of you all for coming, and uh, you're dismissed.